Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are joined by a young writer called Neas Faruqi who has recently come out with a book called An Ordinary Man's Guide to Radicalism, Growing Up Muslims in India. Today we are going to discuss about the book, his journey while writing the book and what does the book talk about. Welcome to News Click Neas. Thank so you. let's start with the title, uh, An Ordinary Man's Guide to Radicalism. Don't you think, I mean, why did you choose such a title and don't you think it might have various misinterpretations when it comes to the public when it comes to the public forum and the reason why i chose this title was basically in some ways it was my way of asserting my identity my individuality uh, this book talks a lot about butler's encounter uh, it's I mean, one of the uh, most important things that it talks about is butler's encounter I and mean, butler's encounter is one uh, event but uh, basically it talks about host of issues when Bartlow's encounter happened I was uh, I was living in Jamia Nagar in the same locality where this encounter happened so after this encounter the kind of media coverage that happened uh, in the Indian media was very scary basically so they were uh, they were maligning the entire I mean it was not about one accused it was about everybody. Community, basically. Yeah. So basically, they were saying that this area is the hotbed of semi terrorist. This uh, uh, semi sympathizer uh, lives over there. Live there. It was it was very scary. The kind of things that you see right now in TV with Republic TV or Times Now. In 2008, when this encounter happened, it was beginning of that uh, a kind of beginning of these kind of hysteria that we see on a daily basis. So. They were calling us uh, terrorist, radical, terror sympathizer. Uh, there was no if and but. I mean, they were, they were not even using alleged, basically. In that environment, it was very scary for us. I mean, uh, I thought when I, you know, when, I, uh, when I was giving title of the book, I thought, I mean, since you're calling me a radical, I will also call myself a radical. Okay, now, I mean, uh, I'm not going to defend myself that I'm not radical, I'm not terrorist, I'm not terror sympathizer. If you call me a radical, I will also call myself a radical. Now go and deal with it. That was the idea. That was an angry idea, basically. Larger point that I want to make, basically, I mean, at one level, it also warns readers about radicalism and all those things, that if you get wise people, it brings a homogeneous set of idea in, in person. I mean, it was, uh, ghetto is a homogeneous population, it's not only homogeneous population, it's also about homogeneous mindset. Right. It could be any form of ghetto, it could be a Muslim ghetto, a forced ghetto like Muslim ghetto, it could be chosen ghetto of, of uh, Brahmins, for example. Right. So in both ways, it, it creates a certain set of, uh, certain mindset. And, I mean, looking at India and its history, it, there has been a tradition of ghettoization when it comes to the marginalized communities. Like, I mean, if you go to villages, you will find Dalits living outside the village in a small locality. So, yeah, I mean. Yeah. No, but the thing is, even Brahmins are also ghettoized, right? Now, upper caste are also ghettoized. I mean, this ghettoization is very different from Dalit or Muslim ghettoization because these ghettoizations are, I mean, there is power differential, of right. course. Obviously. But I will still call uh, upper caste ghettoization, upper caste uh, colonies as, uh, as a form of ghettoization. Uh, this is a contested term, I agree on that. So, in that sense, it, it creates a certain mindset. If, if that ghetto is a hard ghetto, it has memory of riot, it has memory of discrimination, it could become very dangerous. Yeah. I mean, I'm warning that. The third point that I'm trying to make, basically, with this title, is that as a reader, what comes to your mind when you see this title with a young Muslim man or a, young, or a Muslim man's name? Do you really think that it's about radicalism? Or uh, if, if there was a, uh, some other name instead of Niaz Faruqi, Kamal Shrivastha or something else, would you have thought about, really thought about radicalism? Of what, what constitutes radicalism for you and especially if it, you're talking about Muslim? So I was trying to play on that psyche. I mean, it's not at all a guide to, to radicalism. I mean, I'm not foolish to write a guide to radicalism. And one of the, uh, somebody wrote a review that it's, uh, it's not a guide to radicalism. I was like, are you kidding, man? I mean, you just cannot misinterpret uh, that book, uh, this book in that. I mean, it's, it's completely opposite of that, basically. Right. So let's come to various sections of the book separately. Uh, your book also talks about deep mistrust that the Muslim community has when it comes to the state, the police machinery, the administration. Uh, 
and it has developed over the years seeing the situation there has been a rightward shift in the country the right wing forces have become strong they are in the power right now uh, do you think the situation has become much worse when it comes to the current regime it has in a way you know earlier there was some subtlety of sincerity some subtlety of i mean that okay you are equal citizen we will uh, we will protect you i mean that's a very patronizing thing to say that protect but i mean there was some sense that no injustice will be uh, we will not tolerate any form of injustice but right now i mean everybody is like uh, whatever government wants to say they say that i mean right from uh, bjp functionaries or rss functionaries at small level at village level on to the top to to the parliament i mean everybody is like so all the subtlety is gone it's all it's all out in the open whatever anyone wants to say they say it. so certainly it has gone worse i mean look at uh, things like lynching and all it's not happening without any reason i mean it could it is happening because there is uh, inherent complicity of right wing i mean uh, they could stop if they want to i mean they are their uh, foot soldiers basically so but who who is going to stop that uh, i mean all top to bottom right up to prime minister I mean, he has been one of those people who are lynching. Basically, he was not directly part of that, but I mean, it comes from the thought process. But you have a tacit consent when it comes yeah. to I mean, you are ready to tweet when somebody dies outside India, yeah. but when people are getting lynched here, there is no yeah. reaction on that. Yeah. Also, when you were writing this book, you are talking about you are not blaming any political parties, but yeah. when let's connect these two points because if you look at the Congress regime. there's a very narrow understanding of secularism that we see when it comes to congress is secularism only protecting muslims from rights uh, just keeping them safe or is it is it also about providing them good, good education providing them jobs you see such a committee recommendations that have not been followed yet mm -hmm. so i mean did you intentionally decided to not put that blame on anyone or do you see any difference between the two regimes i i put it slightly differently instead of saying that i did not put blame on anybody i blamed everybody okay and i um, if i'm blaming congress or bjp it's not without reason i mean many people will say that you you're crying victim you're trying to play victim hood but i'm playing victim hood because i am a victim as a community right and look at uh, congress's history it in nelly 18 1983 in um, entire gujarat basically ahmedabad and all these surat and and all these places uh, entire 60s and 70s war uh, was i mean uh, there were lots of riots uh, in, in that period 83 nelly 89 meerut 89 bhagalpur uh, 92 even babri and all these things was happening under the watch of congress so i am not going to absolve congress of of uh, their crimes basically and many people see that what bjp does by uh, what congress does by night bjp does it by day so there is not much of a difference i mean congress is more subtle and bjp does it uh, openly i mean basically provocates everybody in a sense congress had been slightly different in last uh, the previous regime was slightly different than uh, their earlier regimes basically you are not doing anything for minorities you are not giving them first right of course but you are giving a statement that is going to create a sense of unease among and uh, majorities such a committee for example that you talked about so you you established a committee you look i mean he, these guys uh, such a committee did an amazing work they brought everything that we needed to know i mean we knew it but they 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 brought that up and and substantiated with data but what did you do you did not follow it up so it's all basically lip service i mean i'm i'm uh, fine with uh, talking about secularism and all but uh, i'm victim of secularism i mean i'm I, when i say i am not talking about individually but as a from, community yeah, yeah. so you also talk about alienation of the muslim community and how they have been i mean the, the, you talk about the othering concept of the muslim community can you throw some light on that part as well because i mean for the people who have not read the book that what do you mean by uh, systematic alienation and othering of the community when we talk about othering a community you know, basically what we are saying what we are doing basically is that even though we are talking about democracy but using the same democratic processes we are alienating them i mean 
look at look at 2014 elections it is perfectly a democratic process of uh, of uh, electing a, a prime minister but go to up it has 80 seats 80 parliamentary seats what do you do you choose 72 or 73 candidates who are from bjp and not a single who is muslim out of 80 that is basically otherization of of our community basically and and what and what is worse it is happening through the mode of democracy i mean this is the most sacred things that uh, that we have as, as indian as all these country around countries around us have been I mean, they have not lived up to, to democratic ideals. We boast about that. Not that we have been living up to democratic ideals, but we boast about that. But even then, in a perfectly democratic country, or, or in a, sup I mean, it's a very good democratic country. I mean, if you look around democracies that we have, it, ha it has been a functional democracy. Even in that functional democracy, we, are, we, are, we have found ways to, to discriminate with people. Also, I mean, you've raised an interesting point that even in democracy, when it comes to, and looking at the current context, um, it, it's becoming more and more evident day by day that you have to prove your existence and nationalism, quote unquote. And how do you prove that? You should chant Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Mm -hmm. You should sing national anthem. Mm -hmm. where, where, while in democracy, you should have right to do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. We have been seeing Tiranga yatras are being taken out from Muslim Muslim localities, and then there is rights which are being created. So I mean, there's always a question that exists in the mind of people from the marginalized communities, and be it any community, be it Muslims, be it Christians, Dalits, that are we actually living in a democracy? That's a question. Where are we heading towards? I don't know. I mean, I mean, there is no clear answer to that. I mean, that's a sad situation, but this is what's happening. And also, let's come back to the book. You have extensively written about the Butler House encounter. And when you uh, give contributions, you talk about for Abu and Ammi and those who are seeking justice. Do you think the people who were who suffered this fake encounter, have they got justice? And let's not only talk about Butler House encounter. There are, yeah. India has a history of Muslims and Dalits being hanged in large number. Yeah. Uh, maximum number of Muslims and Dalits are in jail. A uh, lot of fake cases are being put on people and they have to prove their patriotism, nationalism every day. So have, have any of these people got justice? When I'm talking about, uh, like, uh, when I'm dedicating this book to, to anyone who is seeking justice, basically I'm saying that this book is not about me. This is book is about larger cause and and, and for people who have been, I mean, real, uh, who have faced real sufferings. I haven't faced anything, basically, to, to be precise. Because people have been killed, people have been lynched, people have been hanged, people have been murdered, raped. In that, if you compared, compare my, my suffering to theirs, this, I haven't faced anything. There are a few things that, I mean, Butler's encounter is one of them, and we don't know whether they were terrorists, whether they were uh, innocent, but we, our, our demand was that, I mean, a locality basically demanded that have a proper investigation that has not been done. So we are not saying that they must be innocent. I mean, idea is to get, I mean, it, it was doubtful. There were lots of questions over that. So answer those questions. If you investigate that, you answer that question. But it is not only about Batla's encounter. There have been many encounters, many riots all and over the country. We're seeing that recently in UP at a large extent. Yeah. And when we talk about a Muslim youth in the country, the massive job crisis they, they face, uh, they've been subjected to identities every time, especially if you're a Kas Kashmiri Mus Muslim, you have dual identities to face. Yeah. So there's a continuous dilemma which is there. Either you, you're not able to exist as a self and also the whole community, it's only looked through vote bank politics. I mean, you're not looking into their issues. It's just a vote bank which is there. So you might do an appeasement politics and say, yeah, we care for you. But when it comes to the realities, it's you're far behind when it comes to real development work. Can you throw some light on that part also? I mean, how does it, how can one differentiate these two things? You know, soon after partition, the, the generation that faced partition, they, they felt themselves as, as uh, guilty of partition, especially uh, Muslims uh, who lived in India. 
ideally they would have been i mean they would have uh, people should have respected them because they were the ones who chose to live in india even though they had option an option to leave but they they felt as a victim i mean there were many instances where for example patel patel asking in lucknow uh, soon after partition he is asking people muslims to uh, i don't know where it comes from but he says that muslim should lay arms and they should uh, uh, they should be more patriotic and all those things it was very patronizing here saying that the muslims are not patriotic basically generation after that was clueless he didn't know what to do that what to do how to how to face uh, such kind of uh, identity issues but my generation my generation is very different my generation has uh, no connection with uh, that pakistan movement or partition it has not seen that bad memory basically so they are born in india they have the memory of this india only this generation this generation is very different from the earlier generation they are confident and they are demanding basically their constitutional right they are not asking for any favor they are not asking for anything more than what they deserve and what uh, ideally constitution uh, allows or 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 uh, i mean con- what is theirs constitutionally so this generation is very different i mean look at young politician or look at young young uh, leaders who are emerging i mean we don't have any mass leader but even for even even our leaders like asaduddin owaisi who is seen very differently in india but even he he is basically saying that give us our rights so i mean it's a it's a, it, you know it becomes very tricky yes. how how to how to address your yes. your identity issues how to how to be a citizen of this country an equal citizen of this country so if if you become too vocal uh, Con- bjp is going to exploit that congress will say that don't be too vocal and keep quiet otherwise bjp will exploit that so both are basically you going to exploit you so it becomes very difficult to 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 create a balance if you go and vote for asaduddin owaisi people will say that acha wo to naya jana tumne so you hard, hard, you are declared as a hardliner ha and people will start saying that you have created one more jinna so where do you go what do you do i mean it it, it is very difficult to well, I mean, and it's also a that, bigger yeah. battle to fight let's come to the last point that you are talking about when there's already these contradictions available uh when it comes to the political scenario you need an alternative especially looking at the ongoing attacks that have intensified what is the alternative what's the way forward actually i mean it's a very cliched thing to say but there is only way to address that to become more secular to become more liberal and to assert your liberalism basically so and by liberalism i don't mean that uh, I mean India is a conservative society India is a religious society you have to acknowledge uh, those uh, uh, those entities and those false lines but it doesn't mean that uh, I mean it you know when when BJP is our, our right wing and the right wing wing is taking the discourse to right what do you do you basically assert your on on core beliefs there is no other way out so you go out in street or you write about it or whatever you do you do it honestly i mean there is only way only one way out otherwise i mean if 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 we give in to to what bjp is doing or what rss is asking us to to do so we we are basically turning ourselves into hindu raj basically i mean that's what they want that you you accept their supremacy you accept their ideology i mean if if rahul gandhi has to to go to to mandir to appease their vote bank you basically you have agreed to whatever rss wants you to do so i don't know i mean this is a sad reality but that's what happening i mean we are moving we are shifting our our discourse towards extreme right actually it's a very important point that you have raised that and this is what we are witnessing in, during the karnataka elections that you are going to much yeah. continuously to take their vote bank into your party's fold that is what they did in uh, gujarat they started the entire 
campaign from the Somnath Temple. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Niaz, and uh, many congratulations to you for writing this book. And hopefully, you'll be coming out with such more eye-opening books in future, and we'll be discussing with you those books once again. Thank you for watching News Click.